Welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me are two people who just got done with a massive wrench fight. It's Megan Hoffmeyer and John Levengood. Were we in the movie Dodgeball? Yes. And <laughs> you guys were throwing wrenches at each other. Were we fighting with wrenches or just arguing who had the bigger wrench? No, you're throwing them at each other. And now they're all framed. We have 14 framed wrenches in our home. you got to frame, frame that because if you survive that, someone, even if it was in the heat of not thinking... They basically tried to kill you. Yeah. I mean, you guys, I was worried, but I didn't want to get in the middle of it because I didn't want to catch Aaron Wrench. See, I don't think you two were actually trying to hit each other. Wrench dance fighting? Yes. More exhibitionist? Wrench, wrench aware of. Dan re dancing wrench fighting. But I know <laughs> John was doing some moves. I Like, he was, like, you know, kind of doing that dance thing. John, you did, like, a double back flip tuck. tuck. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I don't know, man. I probably cracked the floor when I landed. <laughs> you, did a, you did a superhero landing and took out the concrete. Right, what like when it? Hulk lands. Nah, we had it padded like a, what are they? The... Oh, yeah, you had like the crash pad? No, like those gyms where people are always... The CrossFitters? Yes. You had a, just a little pad. Yeah, a CrossFit pads pad. all over the whole floor. That double suplex was Protected. impressive. Now, there weren't any fights from Ford vs. Ferrari. No, there was There was a great brawl yeah, in Ford vs. Ferrari. Oh, you mean the grocery brawl? Oh, oh yeah. can we dub it the grocery ball, brawl? That's amazing. It, I, no, really. At the very end of my notes, I have a note that says, Final Fight Pod, colon, grocery fight. <laughs> now, I gotta say. But it's that, not a final fight, though. That's the unfortunate thing. It's we just, should, we'll do middle fights eventually. Okay. Yeah, uh, now, what when about you're, first fights? First fight. Oh, yeah. Or only fights. When you guys were watching hey, this movie... Well, this is the only fight. Fights in movies that aren't fight movies. <laughs> there you go. The best fight... Oh, John. That's a pod. That's a pod. We Boom. each can pick, like, five. Okay. Oh, man. I got, like, eight right now in my head. We're doing it <laughs> next week. All right, so... In the, I love this movie. So this is the fourth movie in our racing series. So John and I have covered Rush, Driven, Days of Thunder, and now we're on to Ford vs. Ferrari. And Megan is joining us for this episode because... We love this movie. I, I wrote the other day, Megan. Remember this? Remember when I sat next to you and I made you proofread my post? Yes. I and wrote... you, you've also found all kinds of interesting tidbits and you go, oh, that's really cool. I can't tell you yet. My notes look like a madman on who hadn't slept in 72 hours wrote in my notebook. for Mark, four... The way that you prepare for pods, though, I often just think of like, who is it? Timothy Hutton in the dark half. <laughs> I feel like you start writing sideways and stuff, and like you come John, out of some room. You're symbols. on Skype. Look at my you, note. You, you come. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm looking at Sam Neill in in the quiet room and in the mouth of madness with writing all over his face. This is just disgusting. And MacGruber yeah. writing down that <laughs> symbols license plate. and drawings and all kinds of things. It's in Mark language. So, you know, in movies like AVP, where they find ancient scripts and they read them immediately, they're like, "Oh yeah, they wrote this. I know what this means." If Somebody got a hold of this 2,000 years from now. They're like, I don't get it. I no, you, what you're writing is more akin to what was in the Arctic subterranean ziggurat and AVP. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there's there's a lot of sweating involved in my writing. There's a lot of just moments of glee. If you hold it up to a mirror, does it have a different meaning? Yes, it does. It's actually the script for Deep Blue Sea. Your writing is what Neo saw before he realized he was the one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he looks at the Matrix. <laughs> wow. You know what's funny? You're like, there's sideways writing, and then I show you my thing, and there's sideways writing on my notebook. But so we brought Megan in for this, John, because all right, for me, Ford vs. Ferrari, I know it made $222 million worldwide. I know it was nominated for Best Picture. I know it won Academy Awards for editing and sound editing. I know it has a 92% tomato meter score, 8.1 on IMDb, which puts it at 190 in IMDb's Top 250. Right alongside Rush. This movie, but I still feel like it's underrated. This, I think this is one of the, this is a great film. Like, I had to do so much research because I would just be fawning about this movie. I think it should have been Best Picture. Holistically, it hits on all levels. It's got the best sound. It's got great characters. It looks really good. It's a four-quadrant -quad picture. It's a, yeah, it's a pleaser all around, whereas you can't say that about a lot of movies that are nominated you're talking to one of your co-workers and he took his daughters who were what 13 16 and 19 something mm -hmm. like that to watch yep. ford vs ferrari and they were complaining the entire way and when they really? got out of the movie they were like but, well because you know who's matt damon who's christian bale what's ford oh you know? i got you and they watched it and they all loved it 
like these 13, 16, 19 year old girls. You mean they were complaining it. all the way to the movie yeah. theater? Yeah. And then they I, I thought you meant it. through the movie. Oh, no. no, but then they watch it and they're like, that was amazing. Like, this movie hits. Uh, James Mangold is an excellent director. I think he nailed this. And so, John, uh, uh, Megan and I, when we were watching the Academy Awards, the guys who won the, the, the awards for sound editing and editing were up there going, Mangold should win. Mangold's the best. You've got to work for this guy. So I found this 55-minute interview of, that James Mangold did with Collider. And I learned a lot about his process, which I thought was really cool. So he started on Copland. And he had everything scripted. He had every because he was young. But then he worked with like De Niro, and De Niro got his back and took took it like helped him out a lot. And so De Niro taught him to just relax, get to know the actors, and kind of just listen and have an open dialogue on set. I think it's pretty cool. He can tell people. So Mangold, he'll if someone's like, "Hey, I what do, what do you think about this?" He's like, ah, "I don't like that." But there's an open dialogue on these films. And Megan and I just watched the clip from the sound editors who talked about the editing for this movie. And then we also watched a clip about the cinematography. So Fidon Papa Michael, who also shot Biodome, but it seems like a very collaborative. <laughs> that's random. Yeah, he sh it's a collaborative film set. And that's why, I don't know, I think Ford vs. Roy works because it's just, I don't know, it's simple, but it's beautiful. I think it's better. That's so good that people don't know how good it is. Well, I'm falling so out complex. here. Well, it's so complex. And just to watch the making of it and those crazy rig cars that they had. It's Nuts. just, that has to be planned for. And the fact that they were saying that there's cars hooked to a rig, but then they had race cars driving around it so they could get in and out shots and they could get flares of tail lights in front of them. That's nuts. I got one more story for you guys, John, and then I promise I'll let you talk. Is that okay? No, no, you go. All right. You're so on roll. I know people who worked on this film because uh, it's shot in Savannah and they told me a funny story. So they had to take down a bunch of signs and mailboxes to make this look period correct. This had to look like it was in the 60s. The problem is, all these signs of miles of road got taken down, but no one kept track of where the signs should go. So all these street signs, stop signs, mailboxes were taken down, and they didn't know uh -oh. where to put them back. Oh, dude, so, their city managers must have been furious. Yeah, so that well, they had to bring in like the like the post like you know the postman out there knows like most of the streets. So they had to get in touch with the city managers in town to put back all the signs. So is that the track for Le Mans? Yeah, that was the track for Le Mans. And because they just needed country roads, so mm -hmm. they just went to Georgia because it's cheaper. But so that, that's not a reflection on, that's more of a reflection on like the transportation, the, mm -hmm. the um, location. The location crew, they should have had pictures and a map, but I, it just looked like they pulled signs out of the road like, yeehaw! And then they had to figure it out. And that's happened to me before. Couldn't on you sets. just use Google Maps, you know, pin yourself and start. Oh, yeah. That's too practical, Megan. That's what I'm here for. So, John, thoughts about Ford versus Ferrari? Okay, so you had mentioned how this, regardless of how much money this made and how much people who thought they'd hate it seemed to think they'd like it afterwards, like those teenage girls, your friends, uh, kids. Like, I... I I think I understand why this would be so underrated, and it's because it has all the elements of a race movie, but to me, it just happens to have racing in it. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is the A River Runs Through It of racing movies. Ooh. Like, if you think of A River Runs Through It, your first, if you've seen it more than <laughs> once, listeners, right? <laughs> and if you've seen it, it's, it's like a, a very early Brad Pitt movie, but like... That movie now they, they they go they go life threatening river rafting after they steal someone's uh, boat to do it like they they have brute they they have some knockdown fights like bar fights and later even though you don't see it you find out that Brad Pitt died in a bar fight like there are some heavy scenes in that and some and some violence underscoring it but people wanted to default think that this is a movie about fly fishing, when really it's a, a movie about a bunch of characters who happen to be linked by fly fishing. And yes, there are a lot of fly fishing scenes, right? But like, they're not trying to tell you a lot about fly fishing. They're trying to tell you a lot about the people who do the fly fishing. And any movie is really about the characters, right? Mm -hmm. Any movie, like Rush is really about the characters. But that movie was still trying to teach us about Formula One. Days of Thunder wasn't as good at teaching us about NASCAR, but they still kind of tried, uh, you know, a good bit. I don't feel like this movie was going out of its way to teach me about its race circuit. By the way, just watched that twice this weekend. I can't tell you what the name of this race league is. Oh, it's just endurance racing. But that's just like I don't yeah. even I don't even know that, though. And yeah. I saw it in theaters and then I just saw it twice thinking about it. And I'm like waiting to write it down. You know what I mean? So they're not even trying to get I don't even know what their 
annual circuit is like. I just know a few things. And so it's, it's interesting, though, but there are great race scenes in it. But again, this is – to me, this is – they're they're not trying to do that. That just happens to be the setting of the story of these characters. Well, it's really – uh, it's interesting you say that, John, because James Mangold, he's like, I'm still not a fan of racing. He's like, I wanted to tell a movie about these characters. And he also said – I kind of like what he said. He's like, making a movie is kind of like getting a car off the ground. He's like, because yeah, there's so many little steps that go into each. And what he said was, you know, uh, Shelby – and and Miles, Carol Shelby and Miles, when they did interviews, they were very, they kind of had a persona, but he wanted to tackle not their documentary personas, but their kind of private life. So he was much more interested in the character. He was much more interested in in who they were as people. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we watched the, what is it, Jay's Garage or something? Yeah, Jay Leno, Jay Leno's Garage. With Jay Leno, where he interviewed Matt Damon because he knew Carol Shelby and he said they'd been trying to do this story for forever, but it just wasn't working. Why was this different? And Matt Damon shared that it had originally been really bloated, lots of characters, and it just wasn't working. It was a really long script. And then they came with a script about just two guys and their relationship and their friendship, and that was the heart of it. So that's how it got made, finally. And you know what's cool, John? The Shelby family loved Matt Damon's portrayal so much that, that they gave him a, a coin. A limited challenge coin. There's like 300 of them. You can't buy them. Like, the family just gives them out. So they gave Matt Damon. That gives you goosebumps. They gave him one of 300 coins because the Shelby family loved his performance so much. That's awesome. That and makes me think of Jim Carrey and Man on the Moon, how, like, uh, Andy's daughter, who, like, never really knew him, talked to Jim Carrey when he was, like, in a mania, like, refusing to be Jim Carrey. And, like, but it, but it was still so important to the family. Like, it's interesting when actors nail something so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that movie messed up Jim Carrey. That's crazy. I talked to, I told that to my students. I showed them the trailer and showed uh, some interviews with him. I wanted to talk about, like, um, method acting. Jim Carrey went method. Yeah, like, but to the point that people thought he was sick. Yeah. He, but he still did an amazing job, just looking at old footage, comparing him. Now, I've never seen footage of Shelby, in, uh, Carol Shelby, in real life. I didn't do any of that for my research, because I figured you were watching every video clip yeah. that you could find Can we that watch compared him to the movie. The Lost interview? Is yeah, we watched the called? Lost interview with him. It's, like, 95 minutes and on YouTube. And, he, you know, he's just like a Texas boy. Uh, he's just kind of... He's not, like, over he was, the top. He but. was, like, an entrepreneur, just a guy who figured out how to get things done, sell stuff, and sold a lot of different kinds of things. Yeah, he was cool. That's a good interview if you're ever curious about it, John. It's pretty Is neat. that on Netflix? Is that yeah. one of the many Netflix things? No, on, on oh, YouTube. No, I'm sorry, on YouTube. We YouTube? scoured YouTube for videos, and we watched a lot. But I, I, I noticed there's a lot on Netflix about, about, about like, uh, the connections to Ford v. Ferrari, but not the movie itself. I mean... So I guess, you know, during these years in what, 64, 65 and 66, when they really wanted that, what the GT, the GT 40 to, to win when Ford went to war with Ferrari, I guess is the name of the movie, geez Louise, <laughs> the, like these were some of the most prestigious races in the world. Like people are dying left and right, but these endurance races, these were like, you know, you have some of these cars that can race for three hours, but they, this was like. Kind of what did they call it? I read it. It's the mo it was the most acclaimed race at the time. This race, the Le Mans. So, well, yeah, the Le Mans, and um, you know they also had the twenty four hour Daytona and then the twelve hour Sebring, and then you know what's crazy about this movie? You know it's nuts. So in the Triple Crown had never happened before. So if they would have let Miles have this. No one's ever, like, that was unprecedented. Yeah, but Shelby admitted in the last interview that it was actually him and BB's idea. To, yeah. He mentioned it to BB, so they made BB a bad guy in the movie, but it was his idea that this would be the photo, and I guess it was unprecedented, it was a huge photo op, it was a real big deal, but he, to the day he died, it sounded like he felt regret over Ken not getting that, because a year later he passed. I mean, it's a brilliant idea for the photo op, right? But you just don't know that weird rule. Well, they said they would. They also thought they would stick it to the people at Le Mans a little bit. Mm. And they came up with this rule. There was nothing in the rule book that said the person who was furthest from the start line was going to be the one that won. Oh. So they came up with that because they sort of gave them a hard time by giving them three winners. 